In January 1986, Britain's leading graphic designer, Thomas Eckersley, visited Duncan of Jordanston College of Art in conjunction with an exhibition spanning 50 years of his work. He kindly agreed to speak to us about his life and work. Born in Lancashire in 1914, Eckersley claims to have been a poor pupil at school due to long bouts of illness, but he did develop an interest in drawing. It was his mother who suggested that he might enjoy art college, so he was enrolled at Salford School of Art. Anyway, I got to Salford, and after about a month there, I suddenly felt, well, this is for me. I loved the atmosphere. It was so different from school. I loved the, 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 the kind of people that were there, and I loved the kind of work that I was doing. So I decided, this is for me. Mm -hmm. And I also felt, when I finish this, I'm going to London, because London is the only place to be in this field, because it's where all the publishers are and advertising agencies. A major turning point in Eckersley's artistic development came while he was at Salford. He saw an exhibition of the work of continental poster designers, including that of A.M. Cassandra. It was so exciting, it was so different from the kind of poster advertising, for example, that you see in, 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 in England, apart from Mac Knight Carfer, who was doing very fine work. But the majority of work that one saw <coughs> in England was very ordinary and, and uh, wasn't in the least exciting. It, it, all this work was obviously influenced very much by what was happening in painting in France at that time, which was a tremendous period with all those giants like Vark and Picasso and Miro and Gris, all those people were working at that time in, in, in France. And what was going on in painting, because of the tremendous power, infiltrated into all other avenues, like um, graphic design, textile design, interior design. All these elements were influenced by what was happening. And of course, the surreal, surrealism again was happening at that time in France, which again had came through into, in, into, into illustration, into graphic work, and so on. So I felt it was, I was very fortunate to be at college at that, that, at that time. Significant also during Eckersley's career at Salford was his encounter with fellow student Eric Lombers. On leaving college, they went to London together in 1934 and set up a fruitful partnership picking up numerous commissions from important advertisers like London Transport, Austin Reed, and Shell Max. We used to, if we had a problem, for example, we would, we would discuss it. We would both think about it and possibly put ideas of the way we felt it might be solved. Then, then we would pool our ideas and decide which one we were going to pursue. And I, I might make a suggestion which possibly might improve the idea that he had put forth forward or vice versa and it worked like this and we we um, Lombers was rather better at certain things he was very very good technically extremely good technically so he was very good for example in lettering designing lettering which I found very rather boring to do and he used to take you know take, take care of that part of it and it worked extremely well but the war ended this partnership Eckersley joined the RAF as a cartographer, still exploiting, where possible, opportunities to design posters. I did a whole series of posters for the um, accident prevention in factories because they were getting a lot of absenteeism at that time due to people falling down manholes, all kinds of things, and they had to do something about it. And so I did a lot of these. I did about 50 of these posters for them. For the, and uh, it was very interesting because you had to deal with a very, a very s simple problem. You had to express the danger of something, of a particular um, job that a, a man was doing in a factory, that if he didn't do it right, it could be very harmful to him, it could be very dangerous. And you, but you had to put this over in a very direct, simple way so that it would be like a message re reaching him immediately. And I learned a tremendous lot from that because it made me think a great deal about how to eliminate, you know, how to get right down to the basics. After the war, Eckersley was awarded the OBE for his services to poster design. 
He carried on developing his own unique brand of visual telegram during a period which, starting in the 30s, was something of a heyday in poster design. Now, during the 30s, that was a very exciting period of poster design happening in England with people in the late 30s, with people like McKnight Carfer, for example, and, and organizations like, like the Underground, and Shell Mex and BP, and others, and the, post, the General Post Office. All these three organizations in the 30s were, had an extremely high standard of poster design. Now, this was due to the fact that at those, in those organizations were men with imagination. Now, at the London Transport, you had, exam for example, Frank Pick, who absolutely believed in design. He was a member of the Art and Industry Council as well, and he had, had a tremendous lot to do with the whole um, organization of the underground, of the design of the stations, choosing the right people, bringing in first to design, the design of the fabrics and the carriages, the whole, everything, the, he was the, the underground was the first organization, as you could say, to have really in England, to have a house style, a corporate identity. They had a, a typeface specially designed by, by Johnston, who was a contemporary of Eric Gill. So, but this was all due to, to, to Frank Pick. And of course, London Transport posters became famous at that time all over the world. To get an idea of the thought processes in Tom Eckersley's mind during the designing of a poster, we asked him to choose one of his own favorite works and describe its evolution. Well, I was asked by the Lepra, British Leprosy Relief Association to design a poster for them. And I went along to see them and um, they briefed me on it and they showed me lots of photographs of, of um, faces um, bitten away by the disease, rather hideous faces, and I didn't want to use photographs for this because I felt it wasn't the way, and they'd already used some photographs. I felt that um, I wanted to use a, a designed image. It was obvious that I would have, somewhere have to suggest leprosy. I wanted to suggest leprosy. It's, it was inevitable anyway, because that's what it was about. Well, while I was in the office, I also saw a map on the wall, and the map showed all the, the regions where leprosy was in the world. Well, it was quite a shock to me because I thought leprosy only existed in, 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 in India and Africa and those countries. I didn't know that it, you could even find it in England and Australia, and, and uh, you, you can see the, the, the scope of where it is. So I thought this may be, if I feel like this, maybe there's lots of others who also wouldn't know that you can find leprosy in the parts of the world. So I put that really at the back of my mind as a possible solution. Anyway, I went back to my studio and started to think about this and I felt, well, I've got to suggest leprosy in some kind of way. I don't want to use a photograph. I've got to find a way of suggesting disfigurement. I've also, I've got to use a human head. Now, what shall I use? A man, a woman, a child. I thought, well, I think I'll use a child because a child has got more human appeal. I think it's going to appeal to people, so therefore I accepted the fact that I use a child. I also have somewhere to suggest leprosy. Now, how shall I do that? So I started to try ways of showing breaking up a face and showing disfigurement. And I tried all kinds of ways. I tried, for example, the idea of using just the word leprosy, repeating it over and over again, passing through the, the face. But it, 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 it wasn't right. I tried many, many ways, and I just couldn't get it. At the same time, I was also working on an idea for using the map, a separate one and I had cut out a map which I was trying on some shapes. And in desperation, I picked up this map and threw it over the face, the silhouette of the face. And I thought, God, that's it. That does exactly what I want. It shows the idea of something breaking up the face of a disfigurement. It also has this double meaning that it shows where it is. So that's, that's, that's the solution. Well, that's how it evolved. 
you see. And I often find that lots of my solutions come in that kind of way. They come from what appears to be an accident. But it's not just, you've got to be able to see it. Most of the posters that I've done in recent years are using this paper, uh, cut out paper. It's not new, as you know, it's been, uh, been going on for a long, long time, but it's, it's an I, I find it's an ideal way of working. Um, if you're using flat colours, for example, and also if you're working the way that I work, where you eliminate things, you get, try to get, dispense with everything except the essentials, you know. And I find that um, this is an ideal way of working. Because you take the Malena Dietrich, for example. Well, when I was designing that, I had much more in than that. I had, um, I had the color of the hair. I had part of the hat in there, the brim of the hat. Now, I found when I was working on it that I didn't need that, that you know she's wearing a hat, don't you? You, you know she's got hair, don't you? Uh, you don't need to see it, and I found I could dispense with it. Um, the same I had uh, other war in the face, actually, which I, I dispense with. Um, and I could do that so easily by having cut all these shapes out. I could put them down and take them away, you see, and immediately you see it. And I find it's an ideal way of working for that reason. things and it started I suppose with the festival in Britain. There's a real feeling for design and a care about it. Now that started to deteriorate near the end of the 70s and since the 80s it's really seemed to absolutely go apart from a few people and it's very sad and, I, and I, it probably will swing, you know, things always swing again, I hope so anyway. Tom Eckersley is still working today mainly for the World Wildlife Fund. His career spans 50 years, but the stunning simplicity, immediacy and wit of his work means that his influence is sure to pervade the quality of our artistic lives for many years to come. decisive person. I mean, I see things in terms of black and white rather than grey. Either it is or it isn't. <coughs> it's yes or no. I don't like the in-betweens and the havering. And it serves with, I think, with design generally. I mean, if I do a thing, I get rid of the greys and eventually boil down to something that is very positive and that's it. And once I decide that's it, then it's my job to make it work because I've committed myself. And I think that one of the things I was talking about this afternoon is this idea of total immersion and concentration and committal to what you're doing. And I find that's very important. And maybe you get something of that from the exhibition downstairs as well. There is a total commitment to can see that it's one man's work, one man's approach, and this is the way he sees it, and that's the way it should be for him, at least. Now, uh, one of the things about your work is it's always been very strongly drawn, and you've hardly ever used uh, photography. Now, I 
um, I would imagine that you began uh, work as a poster artist when the the poster was very much the drawn image, and almost um, the years after the, the Second World War were uh, the heyday, possibly, for British poster art. Um, do you think that's right, and how has it altered since then? I think the war <coughs> gave posters quite a, 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 stimu a stimulus that they hadn't had before, because although uh, posters were used in this country since the beginning of the century and abroad. They were much more appreciated abroad than in this country. Um, and in this country there were men like uh, Calfer and Purvis and Cooper and people like that who were producing really good posters, but very few advertisers were using top quality designs. What happened was that during the war, the Ministry of Information <clears throat> took over the, the role of poster commissioners, and most of the advertisers gave up, or their output was restricted in some way under government control, so they didn't need to advertise to that extent. But the real advertiser was the government, and they set up the Minister, Ministry of Information, and the Ministry of Information had a string of designers, uh, and they commissioned the designers they didn't have actually in-house, and as a result, they produced some very good posters. So posters were seen as the major medium during the war years, and in, as the official war office poster designer, I, um, I participated in some of that uh, popularity and the, the need for the poster. Immediately after the war, a lot of this was switched to, um, to commerce, and everybody had high hopes that the poster would develop as the leading medium. And what happened, of course, was that color photography came in uh, in the middle of the 50s, and by the middle of the 60s, uh, it was so prevalent that I had to really to change my whole technique and, uh, with the poster, although the underlying style of the poster was, that I did was never changed, and still today remains the same. The, uh, the expression of it did, because I realized that the airbrush soft graded tonal values were not showing up distinctively enough against the color photography uh, that was used in poster design. So I resorted to flat colors again in order to, to make a contrast and for the posters I did to show out, and that worked. But then again, color photography is still in but who could have foreseen the impact of the computer-generated image? And that's the next one. And technique uh, and technology uh, is advancing so rapidly today that it's racing on. And very soon, I suspect, the computer will be out of date, too, and it'll be a completely new, thing. for instance, lasers um, uh, is one. Um, Holo holo holograms, holograms mm -hmm. is another, and nobody can foresee how the combination of all these things will affect. Can you imagine posters, images projected into thin air, uh, images you can walk through without being aware that they're there, but you can see from a distance. Images that change every um, ten seconds or so. Uh, you know, th th there's a future, and if you have imagination, you can begin to visualize this. We're going to enter a completely new phase. Um, can you tell us something about the festival? Because I think people still um, remember your work for the uh, symbol, which has um, um, has actually been an extremely long-lasting image. And, and what was it like actually to d a design for the festival, and whether the festival really gave a lot of people a completely new chance after the war? Yes, it did. It was the, the first big, as it were, governmental commission following the war. And remember, the war ended in 45, and preparations for the festival began in 48. So that's a very short time afterwards, because in 1948, uh, they organized this competition for the emblem for the festival, and that was in September of 1948 that it had to be in. And from then onwards, uh, preparations for the festival design-wise began, and Hugh Casson and, and Gordon his Russell team, and Gordon Russell, Michelle Black, uh, Gray, they took over and began to commission designers. As far as I 
was concerned as an individual designer, I didn't have much to do with the festival as such. I wasn't, it was largely an, an exhibition man's mm -hmm. uh, event rather than a, a graphic designer's event. There was the signposting to do. Uh, Which was not very good, was it? It was not terribly good. Um, there were other aspects of the design, but mainly it was an architect architectural exhibition uh, and the exhibition designers. So many designers who had never really touched exhibition design suddenly found they had a talent for this and were worked in anyway. Uh, my contribution, as it were, to the festival itself was, first of all, the emblem, which became almost a uh, national symbol. I mean, I have the festival emblem, uh, photographs of it, carved out of chalk on the downs to be seen from aeroplanes on a terrific scale. I have a little button of it. Yeah, no, I have which a whole I have collection a, of souvenirs. As a school child, uh, I suppose. Yes, and I also have a photograph of a, a rather bizarre use of it, of the festival emblem made out of 604 goldstones taken from a single patient at a post-mortem at a London Gosh. hospital. <laughs> Not the London hospital, a London hospital. And a friend of mine, a doctor, said, you must come and see this. And he drove me over to this hospital. He said, promise you will never divulge the name of the hospital because we shall all be in big trouble. And there was the festival emblem done about that size in these 604 goldstones. Uh, I mean, that was one use of it. But it was everywhere. So that was the festival emblem, and it's still sought after, and there are these mad people, who I call them cranks, who collect still everything to do with the Festival of Britain. There's the Festival of Britain Society, which was established for this sort of ephemera. Then the other thing I did was the cover for the guides. I did a mural for it, for the, uh, the power and production pavilion, uh, showing it was, a, in fact, a flow chart of um, trade and industry, supply and demand, uh, which was interesting. It went right across the top of the gallery, and it was about 40 feet long, or longer, 45 feet. And uh, I did uh, one or two other things, but apart from that, I didn't uh, really do very much. But what I wanted to ask you was the, the festival for design was a very op op optimistic period. Um, I think everybody thought that Britain was on the app, you know, with the, yes. with the Dome of uh, Discovery and um, the feeling that the British industry was getting um, going again after the war and uh, the work of the Council in, in industrial design. And then leading up to the opening of the design centre uh, five years later, um, what do you feel about the mood looking, looking back across 40 years? And how do you think a design is seen uh, today? Um, well, I think that what happened, we, we did have a, a, a spurt here following the festival, no question about it. Furniture design did change uh, instead of the pre-war little knoll suite and all comfy little homes with a lot of decoration and pigeons on the wall. It did make an influence. It was a, really a Scandinavian-inspired mm -hmm. simplicity which took over. And some of our furniture designers and manufacturers were very quick to assimilate this and produce their own men like uh, Ernest Race and Robin Day and people like that. Um, they also had a, a major influence in textiles. And, uh, of course, the um, lighting uh, designers had a chance, and uh, many of the things we took for granted uh, changed completely, and then new technology came in, new forms of lamps, infrared lamps, uh, high-intensity lighting, and then, as you notice, the, um, the ordinary desk lamps, instead of the pre-war Terry angle poise, you've got very high intensity light, very, very small. It mm -hmm. necessitated a completely different conception of design. So it wasn't only the Festival of Britain, but the technological progress that had been made that influenced design in this country. I think we did miss opportunities, and I think now, you know, we have plenty of inventors, but they're never encouraged here. So ideas tend to go abroad.
And it's the same with design. I mean, good design, you always have to fight for, for, for good design to find a use here. Other countries lap it up. That's why so many of our best designers go and work abroad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I wonder if you can tell us how your own design altered, because after the war you were associated with posters, but then you went into a few symbols and you went into illustration and you went into book covers. Um, but tell us about how, how your own design actually spread out into other areas. Well, I didn't... And even into three-dimensional design, yes, I believe, occasionally. Yes. And even invention. Uh, uh -huh. um, I didn't deliberately do that, it just came about. Um, first of all, the, um, the extension into um, uh, book covers was because, oddly enough, Penguin Books were thinking of color covers, and I had done a number of book covers uh, during the war and immediately after the war. And then um, in the 50s, Penguin decided to have some color covers. They'd never had color covers and thought they ought to try it out. And they asked me to art direct uh, the scheme and Hans Schmoller who was the technical director. He was the art director of Penguin Books. But I was art director for this scheme and we worked together. And I involved a basic um, format for the covers and commissioned about 10 different designers. And altogether about 36 different book jackets were designed by this team. Uh, and. Uh, they were used, but Alan Lane was very much against the idea of color covers, and after a year he insisted on cancelling the whole scheme. So um, that was the book cover thing. I did one or two others following that. Um, then came advertisements. I, hadn't, I had done one or two advertisements prior to the war, but then came contacts and clients like the British Aluminium and uh, Wilmot Breton and people like that who were in, in making uh, artifacts for the motor trade and for engineering, uh, that was ICI, uh, and the, the work, the commissions range for designs for uh, advertisements in black and white in colour to brochure covers and, and booklets and things like that. Then of course came stamps, uh, and I did a whole series of stamps for this country and Israel. Uh, as recently as 1973, not recent for you, but recent for me. Um, 75, I think, and some of them had considerable success internationally. Uh, and then I went into um, uh, invention and engineering. I went into industrial design. Um, I wonder whether you can tell us just a little bit about images, the way that you tend to pair images down to their bare essentials, like the, um, the images for Oxfam. And well, also, I, you mean the freedom from hunger? Yes, um, I'm sorry. Yes, the freedom for hunger. Um, Same um, images, and also the the uh, the way that you use words with images. You can yes. you actually combine the two in a very simple manner. Well, I see this concise final image as vitally important, and I think I have to go through all these preparatory stages of throwing out and throwing out, and what you throw out is much more important than what you leave in. Mm -hmm. And I have one of the largest waste paper baskets in any studio and it's always full. And I recommend that to all students and all designers. Keep your waste paper baskets full. Be ruthless with yourself. Pare everything down to its simplest possible form. And then you may be right. The trouble with design, it becomes over decorative. It tries to get in too much information. It's surprising how much information can be imparted by a gesture mm -hmm. without words at yes. all. And I see the, uh, the poster and uh, most of the uh, images that I, and designs that I do as uh, equivalent to a gesture. But you also use images which play a double role, I mean like the, the images for uh, famine relief, um, where you have, have a child which is also an ear of corn. This, yeah. Very, very clever association. Well, you think that's simple, but in fact, <laughs> I'm sorry. I've got all the drawings for that, yeah. and sometimes I look through them and I'm shocked by the number of drawings to get that form. And I'll never forget that, but I'm glad you picked that up because I had to go to Rome for a briefing, and uh, after a three day briefing of what the activities of um, follow the, the organization of the UN that deals with them. I had an interview with the director of uh, the FAO, Dr. Sen, and 
he called me back as I was leaving. And I'll never forget it. He said, you know, Mr. Gaines, I want to say one thing more to you. To design this poster, you have to be a philosopher as well as an artist. And those mm. words rang in my ear. And it wasn't until I began working on it that I realized how right he was. You had to be a philosopher. And you, you had to, to put in much more than was required for a commercial poster to do this. And something like two or three hundred drawings, all of which I have retained, were involved in it before I could get it down. And interestingly enough, the first sketch embodies everything that the, the other sketch does. But to get it down to its simplicity, so that it talked from 50 yards away, 100 yards away, that, that was the difficulty. And it's only a two-color job. And you also play great games with uh, words with the posters for the Royal Shakespeare Company, didn't you? Yes. Well, that was really Shakespeare designed that. Yeah. Uh, yes, that was an interesting thing. They wanted a poster for their uh, centenary appeal, and uh, I did that one. And uh, it, it, it's still a good one, I think, that one. And it's highly educational for children and things like that. There's also something else which occurs to me, is that, that um, you, along with Tom Eckersley, I think were very good at almost making posters that were puns, or not, I mean, the sort of visual, visual puns, a kind of way of yeah, thinking that must have been, yes, which must have been very common in the 40s and 50s, I think. Sometimes, well, they are puns. I mean, even that freedom from hunger thing is in a way a pun. It's a serious pun, but it's a, it's a play on two uh, distinct, uh, ideas uh, or two f distinct forms and they're brought together and I think this idea of the visual pun it's not new you know the the ancients employed it but there's a time to use it and a time not to use it and I don't always employ it as you, you've seen this afternoon but sometimes it, it, it's a good thing and after all a pun it, it does introduce a new uh, spurring of the mind you know, you have to go over the ground and re-establish the connection that, that, that's been made in the pun, you see. And then you say, ah, that's clever, you see, I've seen it. Then it goes in. If you can be made to think about things, if the spectator can be made to think about things, to follow almost the same thought process as you've done, then I think you've succeeded in involving him. But if he just looks at it and says, you know, pretty, that mm -hmm. isn't good enough. But if you were to ask me which three posters I would like to be remembered by, uh -huh. which is a different story, because here I'm talking not in emotionally but objectively, then I'll tell you. The first one is the Your Talk May Kill Your Comrades. Oh, yes. The spiral ending in a bayonet going through three soldiers. I think that is a good poster. I think the next good poster I did was the Guinness poster, because it's the other end of the scale, it's humorous, it's cheekily simple, with the G. Is that five million no, Guinness? No, it's the, other the one. G, uh -huh. Guinness poster, in which the G is also a man in a bowler hat ah, and yes, glass right. uh -huh. It's very simple, it's won five first prizes in five different countries. And I think that's a good poster. And the third poster is the freedom from hunger we've just yes. been talking about. And I think that's a good poster. And if I can say that I've done three good posters, then I think it's enough. Well, you'll be remembered for them, I'm sure.